Okay, good morning. Um, thank you uh, for the invitation to speak today. I'd like to talk about quantum nanoscience in the context of superconducting qubits and also quantum engineering. And it's really a pleasure to be here. So thank you, Andreas, for letting me a part, be a part of this. Um, it's an exciting time for superconducting qubits. And, you know, I just show here um, a picture of a 16 qubit chip from IBM. And this is uh, bristle cone from Google. And indeed, quantum supremacy appears to have been uh, demonstrated by these folks. And I won't go into detail on that. Um, but it's a very exciting time. And Rigetti has, you know, online quantum computers as well. Uh, this is Intel's. I haven't seen the data yet, but this is 48 qubits here. And of course, D-Wave has been selling systems for a long time. So it's very exciting, but what I would like to do is just take one slide to take a step back and say, why don't we look at the uh, history of classical electronic computing first? And we know that the vacuum tube was invented in 1906, and it was used for radio transceivers for a good 40 years before we had the first vacuum tube-based computer called ENIAC, which I'm, I'm sure you've heard of. And around that time, at Bell Laboratories, the transistor was invented. And although about 10 years later we had a fully transistor-based computer called TIXO, or TX0, um, shown here. Um, this didn't look anything like the computers we have today. Um, it was basically three legs of a transistor soldered together in different ways. Now, around that time, the integrated circuit was invented, but it wasn't until the 1970s that we had the first chips, the Intel 4004 and the 8008 processor. And then another 20 years before we had the Pentium Pro and millions of transistors. And then another 20 years before we had um, the GPUs and the multi-core processors that we see today in, in, our, in our laptops. And so if you look at this, it was well over 100 years of development to get from the very beginning to where we are now. And we can compare that with quantum computing, which is relatively nascent. It's very early on. Um, Richard Feynman in the early 1980s suggested that if you want to use uh, or if you want to simulate a quantum system, you should use a quantum system to do that. There are just too many degrees of freedom for classical computers. And theorists thought about this for about 15 or 20 years before they came up with things like Shor's algorithm for uh, prime number factorization, um, Grover's algorithm for unsorted database searching, uh, Nishimori and Eddie Farhi came up with quantum annealing and adiabatic quantum computing. Um, and it was yet another 20 years to get to where we are today, which is with these online, small-scale, cloud-based quantum computers, and also the first demonstration of quantum supremacy. And so the, the takeaway message here is that, yes, it's very exciting. We're very glad that we're making progress, but it's still very early in the game. Quantum computing is certainly transitioning from technical, uh, or from scientific curiosity to technical reality. That's absolutely happening. But to realize something um, that's useful, uh, like a useful machine, that's going to take time, and it's going to take engineering. So what I'd like to talk to, about today are superconducting qubits. And just one slide to describe what they are. Um, a superconducting qubit can be thought of as a quantum harmonic oscillator with an inductor and a capacitor in parallel. Um, we make it out of superconducting materials. So it's very low loss. And when we cool it down to low temperatures, temperatures that are low enough such that the thermal energy KT is much less than this frequency separation here, um, we have quantized energy levels. Um, now, it's not such a useful quantum object for computing because the uh, frequency separation between 0 and 1 and between 1 and 2, et cetera, is the same. So we can't isolate the 0, 1 transition without driving all the transitions in the latter. So what we do is we replace this inductor with a nonlinear inductor called a Josephson junction. And a Josephson junction is basically two superconducting leads separated by a very thin nanometer scale uh, oxide barrier. And what that does is, is it changes this from a harmonic oscillator to an anharmonic oscillator. And so this potential profile is different. The energy levels are no longer equally spaced. Uh, this is a property called anharmonicity. And so we can uniquely drive the 0, 1 transition without driving the 1, 2, or the 2, 3, et cetera. And the more anharmonicity, the better. So, so this is a superconducting qubit. It's in fact called a transmon, a fixed frequency transmon. And it's one of a whole family of superconducting qubits or artificial atoms. And this could be a Mendeleev table of them. But they can all be thought of in terms of this you know, generalized flux qubit that I'm showing here. And, and basically, we have that same junction. And it's in parallel with a capacitor. But we then open up a loop here 
where we can apply a magnetic field. And that magnetic field allows us to tune the energy level of the qubit during the measurement. And we may want to increase its inductance, so we put an array of junctions here. And, and all of the family of superconducting qubits can be rewritten in this way. Now, basically, the design parameters that we have are things like the critical current of that junction, the capacitances in the circuit, uh, the number of extra junctions we add, um, and the area ratio between the small junction and the larger ones. And based on these design um, parameters, we can design the atom to have a particular qubit frequency, we can define its anharmonicity, and we can trade off its sensitivity to different types of noises. So this is basically the engineering aspect of superconducting qubits. Now, we fabricate these um, using silicon uh, processing tools. This is a silicon based technology because we grow it on silic we grow materials on silicon wafers we fabricate them using the same um, tools that we use on our CMOS line as a matter of fact so these are manufactured um, lithographically scalable uh, devices now if I look at this here this is an eight inch wafer uh, with lots of devices on it if we zoom into just one of the devices this is five transmons lined up in a row and you can see this is around 200 microns uh, scale bar we zoom in on one of these plus signs, that's actually a capacitor, and that's around 50 microns. We zoom in further, and we see this loop that I was talking about, and that's maybe on the order of five to 10 microns. And then there's a junction here and here. We zoom in on the junction, now we first see something called nanometer uh, here, which is uh, the nanometer scale of this junction, maybe on the order of 100 nanometers. And so it's a reasonable to ask, question to ask is that these things are huge. So as Andreas said, what, what is the nano in quantum, you know, superconducting qubits? Where is the quantum nanoscience? And I think the answer to that question is in the coherence, as Andreas said. And so, you know, over the past two decades, the coherence time of these qubits has increased more than five orders of magnitude. I won't read through every single bullet point here, but there's a huge number of different types of qubits, and, but the trend is increasing and uh, we don't yet see a physical limitation to it continuing. Okay. And these improvements have been a combination of efforts by people worldwide in materials, fabrication, and design. Now, at MIT, we work on several different types of these qubits. We don't have a favorite one. Um, the times that you see here are all state of the art. Uh, the very last slide I'll show um, is a new type of qubit based on graphene. So that, that'll be at the very end of the talk. And its coherence time is still relatively low as we figure out what's limiting the, the, the coherence times here. So there's been a remarkable improvement in coherence. And um, this is related to the materials, the fabrication, and the design of these qubits. And I'd like to mention that we have a couple review papers out if you'd like to learn more um, about superconducting qubits and these devices. But to improve coherence, we have to fight against a number of different uh, sources of noise. And I've listed just a few of them here. Some are charge fluctuations in the substrate, of course, magnetic field noise threading this loop, um, trap vortices, phonons, photons, um, quasi-particle tunneling and defects in or near the junction. And many of these, in fact, um, are off at the nanoscale. And, and we need to solve them because, as I'll argue in just a moment, we've, um, we've basically uh, run out of gas in terms of the design improvements that we can do. And so we really need to address now the material science and the fabrication engineering. So what do I mean about this? Well, there, there were a number of design workarounds from the early days to get to where we are today. And what I mean by that is, if we look at the first qubits that were ever built, many of them had a parallel plate capacitor. And with a parallel plate capacitor, almost all of the electric field is held within this dielectric region of the capacitor. So 100% participation. And of course, there are many defects um, in, this, um, in this capacitor. And so what was quickly learned, uh, well, over time anyways, is that if you open up your designs, make them much larger, and in fact, take a parallel plate capacitor, make it a lateral plate capacitor. The electric fields then go from one plate to the other, but basically, what are they passing through? Well, high resistivity silicon, that's Q, um, high Q, or maybe through vacuum, of course, that, that's obviously high Q. And so the, the amount of this electric field density that's actually passing through a defect on the surface becomes vanishingly small. And you have to um, interact with a defect in order to lose energy to it. And so these qubits, um, 
could have T1 times uh, energy relaxation times in excess of 100 microseconds. But of course, this is in a three-dimensional cavity. It's quite large. And so what um, my own research group and many others are doing is we back off from this into still a two-dimensional, what we would view as an extensible architecture. But still, the sizes are very, very large. Okay. So, so we've, we've basically done this design workaround. And, and now the question is, how do we further improve coherence times? And it comes down to material science and engineering. And it's a virtuous cycle, and it's very difficult. And it's difficult because there are many things that have to happen. So first of all, you have some concept of, I want to improve something in my device. Maybe it's a two-level system that I've identified. And the first thing you need to do is you need to grow materials that hopefully don't have that defect in the first place. Maybe do some analysis to confirm that fact. We then need to do um, device design and fabrication. And fabrication engineering is key, because you can start with a perfect, pristine device. And as soon as we fabricate it into the qubits that we want, we reintroduce all these defects again. OK. Um, and then we have to do testing, which requires dilution refrigerators, electronics, and software. And at the very end, we have to decide, did we make an improvement or not? And to do that, we do something called noise spectroscopy. And that's what I would like to talk about in just a moment. But then, OK, you make a determination, and then you update your ideas, and you keep zooming in, and eventually um, you, you come up with an answer. And you've eliminated one source, right? And so I think that as a field going forward, we need to expand on material science and fabrication engineering. And this is very closely connected with quantum nanoscience. And so with that, let me now talk about um, quantum nanoscience and engineering in this context, which is first a discussion of dynamical decoupling, and then how we use it to do noise spectroscopy and understand what noise sources we have in our system. First for Gaussian noise, and then a recent work that we've done on non-Gaussian noise spectroscopy. This is new and uh, led by a graduate student in my group, Young Kyu Sung uh, from Seoul National University, now at MIT. And so noise spectroscopy, um, why do we need it? Well, quantum computers have to operate in the presence of noise. And we eventually want to use error correcting protocols with thresholds that depend on the noise properties. And today, we usually make assumptions uh, about the noise, such as Gaussian. It's very well behaved. But in general, it doesn't have to be that way. And so there's really a range of noise from models which are fairly limited to models that are fairly general. And you know this all white Gaussian noise or Markovian noise is a fairly limited subset. It's easy to analyze, but whether it represents reality or not, it's not so clear. Now, there's non-Markovian noise. And in fact, we have it. There's colored Gaussian noise. We have 1 over f noise in our qubits. We know that for a fact. Right? And so we're getting away from this Markovian noise limit. And of course, um, the most general type is non-Gaussian noise, statistics in principle to all orders. And so the question is, how do we characterize noise in our systems so that we can then go back and fix it? And so what I'd like to do is show a few videos here that represent the architecture um, of a quantum computer. Okay, So let me just talk briefly about the architecture. At the top is the application. Um, the user interface where you program the computer and you're going to run an algorithm. And that algorithm is run by a logical controller. Of course, we have those in classical computers too. It interprets the language that you wrote and it implements the gates on the physical qubits at the bottom. But what quantum computers will have are these two additional layers right here called passive error suppression and active quantum error correction. And so let me talk about the first three layers in the context of this sport that uh, we play in the US called uh, lacrosse, if you've heard of that. And the goal of lacrosse is you, um, you carry a ball in a stick with a basket, and you want to run to the other end of the field and, and shoot it into a goal. We'll see somebody score in just a moment. Now, this guy right here was very unhappy with me because when I videotaped him, I told him, do what you've been told not to do or taught not to do in lacrosse. And this is the physical qubits. Physical qubits are subject to noise in their environment. And what we see here is um, this player is running. And because he's running, his body is bouncing. So there's a lot of noise due to him running on, on the ground. And as a result, the ball is going to fall out of the stick very easily. That's why you don't do that. But this is basically um, a lacrosse player being impacted uh, in the presence of noise, the noise of him running. Now, this second layer here is called passive error suppression. And this is where we can decouple 
the noise of him running from, from the ball and the stick. And the way that they do that is by a process called cradling. You just do this back and forth. You don't even think about it. You just always do this. There's no feedback, right? I'm just doing this. Right? And what you see is that by doing that, he's decoupled the ball from the noise of him running up and down, and the ball never falls out. Okay. And we'll show in just a moment how we can implement pi pulses on the qubit to achieve the same dynamical decoupling of the noise. And in a moment, uh, yes, this is the goal, and he just scored. Okay, so good. Now, even though we may have this passive error suppression, there are still enemies or defenders um, or defense that come up behind you occasionally and they're going to knock the ball out. You can't help it. And when that happens, you have to do something active. You first have to recognize, oh, I dropped the ball. You then have to identify where it went, and then you actively have to go and pick it back up again. Okay, that's called active error correction in quantum computers. Um, it's contemporary research right now to demonstrate this, and it's very expensive. It takes a lot of effort. And so for that reason, it behooves us to do everything we can at the passive level to get rid of as many errors as possible so that we only have a minimal number left that we then have to actively error correct. Okay, so I hope this gives an in indication of how um, passive and active error correction works. Okay. So, Let's now talk about superconducting qubits and, and what we do. So this was a qubit from, I guess, about eight years ago. At the time, it was a, um, the longest coherence time that had been recorded in superconducting qubits. Um, these are called Rabi oscillations. And you can see that these oscillations decay in time due to decoherence. OK, what type of decoherence? Well, there are a couple different kinds. Uh, the first one we'll call the relaxation rate gamma 1, which is the inverse of T1, the relaxation time. Now, this is the block sphere. And you can think of it as the planet Earth, where the North Pole is state 0 and the South Pole is state 1. Let's say state 1 is the excited state. Um, and T1 is the time over which the excited state is going to relax back to the ground state. So the South Pole relaxes to the North Pole. That's T1. There's another time scale called the decoherence time, or T2. 1 over T2 here is the decoherence rate. And that's basically a statement about how the block vector or the qubit state behaves when it's on the equator. Now, there are two, things that, two ways that things can go wrong on the equator. One is the block vector could just relax from the equ equator back to the ground state. That's a T1 effect. Okay, we've already thought about that. But there's something else that can go wrong, and that is the direction that I'm pointed on the equator over time due to noise can change. Right? And eventually it blurs out, and I don't know which direction I'm pointed anymore. And that's called dephasing, if you think of this as an angle on the, on the equator. And that also has a time. T phi. So the decoherence time T2 is related to both T1 relaxation and dephasing. Now in this particular qubit, we measured these two, and we saw that the T1 was quite long, 12 microseconds, but the T2 was only 2.5 microseconds, so that's relatively short. The question is, what's going on? Well, if T1 is long and T2 is short, it must be T phi is short, so dephasing was short. So how did we correct for this? Well, let's first see what, we, what happens when we don't do anything. So this is the block sphere again. And this, you can see, is the qubit vector. And I've simulated here about 15 or 20 different instances under the impact of this 1 over f type flux noise. OK, right there. And what we see, or what we saw, let me do it again. So what we see is that this is um, dephasing quite a bit during this um, period where we're not applying any pulses. And these two pulses that you see here, that's just to put the qubit on the equator and then to bring it back off. Now, this is low frequency noise. And so during any one of these experiments, the noise is basically quasi-static. The energy levels are basically fixed. But over time, they shift due to the, the noise. So during this. Um, free evolution period here, the energy levels don't change. So this is basically a rectangle function. And the Fourier transform of a rectangle function is a sinc function, which is shown here, centered at zero frequency. And this filtering effect, due to doing nothing, in fact, passes almost all the noise um, that we have from 1 over f noise. It's all low frequency noise, and the filter lets it right through. So this is the worst strategy. And that's why we had a lot of dephasing. But what you can do is you can apply a pi pulse right in the middle 
um, of this evolution, which basically flips everything around. And now the uh, vectors that were going faster will catch back up, and those that were going slow will retard back down and eventually refocus themselves just with that one pi pulse. So you can think of it as the lacrosse stick going this way. Now, if you analyze this, you have a rectangle function here and here, but there's a plus sign and a minus sign. And that Fourier transform gives you this green function here, which now is centered at higher frequency, and it actually has a zero at zero frequency. Remember that, because we're going to come back to that. Um, you can then continue to do this, and it's the same idea. You now refocus twice during this period. You have a plus and a minus and a plus sign, and this filter has now moved out to even higher frequencies. You can see it's suppressing even stronger the low frequency noise. And as you add more and more pulses, this goes out to higher and higher frequencies. Um, and as a result, you can actually beat back the dephasing until you're limited almost entirely by the relaxation off the equator. And so this is really lacrosse cradling back and forth and back and forth. Okay. Now, if you look at this, you say, that's great. That's called dynamical decoupling. But you can also look at this and say, maybe I can use this as a, a sampling filter if I can make it narrow enough. And so that is called noise spectroscopy, where you, you, you arrange the pulses in such a way that you can take this narrow filter, this window, and you shift it around in frequency and sample the noise at different frequencies so that you can reconstruct this noise power spectral density. And that's, that's noise spectroscopy. And so we had, over the years, have come up with basically this table. You can find it in Feyan's paper from 2013, where basically we've, we've said these are the different techniques during free evolution or driven evolution for T1, longitudinal relaxation, or T2. It's basically a recipe. But it's all for Gaussian distributed noise. Okay. And what we've done more recently um, with the work of Young Kyusung is that we've now extended that to non-Gaussian noise. So let me talk about that here. So why do we have non-Gaussian noise? Well, one reason is the defects in the environment uh, could be diluted to the point where you start to hear individuals. That would be non-Gaussian. Another is just based on the spectroscopy of our qubit. This is the qubit spectroscopy as a function of uh, magnetic field flux. And if we bias it over in this linear regime, and we have Gaussian flux noise fluctuating around, that translates directly just to Gaussian dephasing, because it's just a linear transfer function. But we don't like to bias there. We gen generally like to bias our qubits at these you know, first order insensitive points, like this. And now if we have Gaussian flux noise, of course, we get Gaussian squared dephasing. And that is manifestly non-Gaussian. Okay? And so all qubits which operate at uh, these flux insensitive points are all not sensitive to non-Gaussian noise. And you can see the difference here. If the Gaussian is shown in this, um, this blue normal distribution, of course, when you rotate or rock back and forth here, you can only go to higher frequencies. You never go to lower frequencies. Okay. So th that's basically the origin of this noise. Now, one, one slide of math to make a, a point here. In a Gaussian dephasing process, the phase as a function of time has these two terms. And the first one is related to the filter function at zero frequency and, and the average noise UB. Sorry about that. Um, and in, in the second term, we have um, higher order cumulants in principle. But for these CPMG sequences, or the dynamical decoupling sequences, we saw that the, the filter function was manifestly zero at zero. So that term goes away. And if you have Gaussian noise, there are no higher order cumulants, so there's, there's nothing to worry about here. And basically, the phase as a function of time should refocus back to zero. We'll see in a, in a movie in just a moment. Now, we can contrast that with non-Gaussian dephasing processes. And in this case, again, for these CPMG type sequences, um, the filter function is zero at zero frequency, so this term goes away. But now, we can't get rid of these higher order cumulants or these higher spectral components. They, they stay, and that's the problem. And this leads to phase which doesn't refocus properly, even when you do dynamical decoupling. Okay, so let's see an image of this. Um, oh, in just a moment. So the first thing is that we have this nonlinearity in the system, and we can measure it. Um, and so for sufficiently weak noise, the phase will go as power cubed, noise power cubed, and the phase decay rate will go one order lower. That's the, the power squared. And so 
Uh, for details of why that's the case, please look at the paper. But what I can say is that we've measured as a function of noise power here, you can see that it follows at lower powers this cubic relationship here. But then it eventually deviates, and the reason it deviates is because um, at higher uh, powers, we start to see the fifth order, not just the third order term. And so similarly with the noise power, the phase decay rate follows the uh, P squared that we would expect. But then as we increase to higher powers, we start to see now P to the fourth and P to the sixth kick in. So this is behaving the way that we expect. Um, again, with strong noise, you'll start to see the higher cumulants. But at weaker noise, you basically see the leading order term of this uh, non-Gaussian noise. OK. So now to see what happens. So if we have Gaussian dephasing, we're going to do the same Ramsey experiment. Um, and we're going to see how the block vector behaves. So it, or sorry, this is a CPMG, um, two pulse CPMG. So we refocus it a little bit. But basically, this vector is always pointed along the y axis because the phase doesn't change from Gaussian noise after refocusing. It depolarizes, but it doesn't change the direction. What I found very interesting is for non-Gaussian noise, that's not the case. And so here, to make it easier to see, we're going to detune the pulses so that we can see how it evolves. So the, the block vector evolves, and then we refocus. And you would think it comes back to 0. We're going to refocus again. And it should stop, but it doesn't. It keeps going. And that's, that's manifestly due to non-Gaussian noise effect. Right? You, you can do these dynamical decoupling pulses, but it's not going to um, get rid of the non-Gaussian noise. And that's why it's important. So um, for more information on this, I, let me refer you to the paper again. So just like we had filter functions in one dimension and we could reconstruct a noise power spectral density in one dimension, we can create um, pulse sequences which give us a two-dimensional uh, frequency filter or function and use that to reconstruct this what's called the bispectrum in, yeah, the bispectrum, uh, in the frequency domain. And so we came up with a bunch of pulse sequences uh, with the help of our colleagues at Dartmouth, Lorenza Viola and her group and use that to basically reconstruct this, this function here. So we applied a known engineered source of noise to the qubit. And then we showed that the technique developed here can actually recover that noise, this bispectrum. And I think this is um, one of the first times, if not the first time, that this non-Gaussian noise has been measured directly. I should say that this spectrum has been recovered directly in a solid state circuit. So as my last slide, um, I just want to highlight another aspect of um, using nanoscience uh, to do a quantum thing, which is a qubit. And what that is is that we used graphene um, to make a weak link, so like a Josephson junction. So here's two superconducting leads with graphene in the middle. Or sorry, this is HBN. Here are the two leads, the two superconducting leads, graphene encapsulated with HBN. Uh, to make a weak link, which we then connected to this capacitor. And now we have the LC resonator qubit. And um, we showed that we can actually get coherence here. And so this is a T2 star Ramsey experiment of about 50, mic 50 nanoseconds. Um, and, and the question that we want to answer next is, is why is it 50 nanoseconds and not 50 microseconds? So um, the, the, the one interest we have in this qubit is that it is um, tunable by a gate voltage. Is that with a back gate behind this Josephson junction, we can actually tune the properties of the Josephson junction. Whereas in the conventional qubits we use today, we have to make a loop and change the magnetic field through the loop to change the qubit frequency. That requires a current. So this is a voltage bias junction or qubit rather than a current biased one. And so with that, let me conclude. My time is up. So. Uh, a large team we have it at MIT. Here's at the MIT campus and also at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. And I thank you for your attention.